Okay, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I uh, feed off of other people's energy a little bit more. I'm an introvert, if you don't know me. Uh, some people don't believe it, but I've learned how to act like an extrovert out of pure necessity. But quite honestly, I would rather hide in the corner over there on a chair with a book than talk to any of you. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just who I am. It's how I'm built. And so when it comes to the aspect of the gospel or evangelism, the very thought causes sweat just to run down my face. Because growing up, whenever evangelism was talked about, it was always in the framework of being an extrovert. You go up to a perfect stranger, you get in their face, you ask them incredibly personal questions like, if you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? And it's a very confrontational, and it's just like, ah. And so when I did a lot of work on OSU's campus, one of the things we did is we went out on campus, we talked to perfect strangers, and we asked them very confrontational questions because that's what the gospel is, right? So I'd be out there for an hour, and the first 50 minutes was me just wandering all around the Oval, deciding who I didn't want to talk to, trying to get the courage to talk to somebody. So I'd find the nicest looking person in the world. They'd shoot me down and say, well, I tried. And then I'd go home and say, I did the gospel. I'm done. And I think everything came to a head at one point when I was at a family gathering and there's a bunch of extended family. We're there talking away in the night, and then somehow I ended up in a room alone with one of my aunts. And she's not a Christian. She makes it very clear she's not a Christian. But all of a sudden, she started opening up to me about how she's really nervous because her son is about to go on this cross-country trip with his girlfriend in a car from the East Coast to the West Coast. They have no plans barely any money, she's freaking out, and she's talking to me. And I'm like, wow, talk about setting the ball up on the tee for the gospel. So I took a swing, and I thought I was doing really well, because she was there, she was nodding, she was nodding. I talked about the peace of Jesus Christ, how it surpasses all understanding, she's nodding, she's nodding. So I'm like, nonverbal cues, this is good, this is good, she's nodding, nodding, off to sleep. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's it. <laughs> now, my mom told me not to feel that bad after she got done laughing at me. She goes, well, it could have been you were very soothing, or it could have been the abundance of alcohol she had shortly before your conversation. But either way, it was cold comfort. And I was like, there has to be another way. For an introvert like me, if I'm an extrovert, this is great. If you're an extrovert, go for it. But I'm like, for an introvert, for someone who doesn't like just random conversations with random people, having to have the answer and zingers all the time, there has to be another way. And surely God has provided another way if he's wired me as an introvert. And so over the years, I tried different ways. I experimented, and eventually... Over time, this is where I currently am. And my hope is not that you'll be like, wow, Seth is a master in evangelism. But rather, hey, I can do this. Now, this is something I could do with a friend or with a family member. It's worth a shot. My hope is that this idea of a questioning evangelism, basically evangelism, using questions. So you're not the one on the spot for the answers. You're just asking people a question, following up with a question and another question. It would be something that you might find useful, something that you might say, I can do that. And when we talk about questioning evangelism, there's three parts that I've kind of come up with. The first one 
is investigate assumptions. Because whenever we make a statement, or if we're ever asked a question by something, by somebody, there's assumptions built in. One guy, his name's Randy Newman, he wrote this book, Question Evangelism, from which I stole this title, Question Evangelism. He relates a story. He was on a campus, and someone asked him, how can you believe in a God who sends people to hell? His response was, do you believe in hell? The kid was like, no. He's like, well, why are you asking me such a ridiculous question? And then the kid's friend says, well, I believe in hell. And Randy apparently said, well, all right. Do you believe that people go to hell? The kid said, yes. To which Randy said, all right, who might be in hell? And then it just continued. And the conversation began with all he did was ask questions because there were assumptions. There, when someone says, how can a God send somebody to hell? There's an assumption that hell exists, that God sends people there, and built into the attitude is that it's unfair. And so by asking questions, we can get to the assumptions which can dismantle a lot of hostility. And what it also does is it does number two. It engages the heart. Because when we're asking questions, our desire is not to get into a game of trivial pursuit or jeopardy or be like a lawyer, grilling somebody with questions. But we want to know the person's heart because we're concerned about the person. So we want to connect the head to the heart to have a real conversation, to know what's really bothering them on the inside, to know what's really in the way of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And then lastly, what that leads to is an invitation for a response. Sometimes the response is the person says, you know what, I want to believe in Jesus right now. Other times, the response is, you know what, I really want to think about this some more. Let's talk about this some more. There's a response because the heart's engaged. The person's now involved in the conversation. And scripturally, in Proverbs chapter 20, Solomon writes this, and this is kind of the essence of questioning evangelism. He says, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Because sometimes we hold assumptions, we hold thoughts, maybe antagonistic to God or the gospel, but we ourselves don't even know where that hostility or standoffishness is even coming from. And so in question evangelism, by asking questions, we're attempting to be that person who goes alongside to lower a bucket deep down the well into the heart to draw out the purposes, to draw out what's deep on the inside, bring it to the surface, and explore it together. And this is also a technique that Jesus used himself quite a bit. If you read through the Gospels, the four Gospels, you'll notice people are asking Jesus questions quite a lot. But most of the time, if you actually keep track, and one author did keep track, Jesus does not respond to a question with an answer. He responds to a question with a question. In one passage, what we'll look at today is in Luke chapter 10. And there's a lawyer who comes up to Jesus. This is Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. So if you have Bibles underneath your chair, you can grab those. I'm not going to project all the verses, just a couple key ones. And so here's a lawyer so you know you're on the spot when there's a lawyer involved. And so a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what, must, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, it's a very pointed, very direct question. He's a lawyer. He's looking for a very specific answer. And you get the hint, since this is a test, that no matter how Jesus answers it, he's going to try to pick Jesus apart. Because he's a lawyer, right, Thad? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so what does Jesus do? He responds with not one, but two questions. 
he, a- he responds, what is written in the law? You're a lawyer. You tell me. How do you read it? And right here, Jesus is going to step one, which is investigating the assumptions. He's trying to help the lawyer find out the assumptions behind the question. And it's also a nice way to sidestep a trap, to sidestep some coming in and saying, whatever you answer, it's wrong somehow. And he's just dismantling the weapons right in the lawyer's hands by finding out what are the assumptions. And so the lawyer responds, and he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So he does a very straightforward answer to which Jesus says, You're correct. Now do this, and you will live. And right there, the lawyer responds. And right here is where we find out what his assumptions are. Verse 29, he says, But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? He says, Look at the assumptions. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Who is my neighbor? So first of all, he's assuming you do something to inherit eternal life. Second, by his answer, he's saying, what do you do? You love God with everything you have, and you love your neighbor as yourself. You do these two things, you are good enough to get eternal life. And built in his response to Jesus saying, do this and you shall live, you also find some other assumptions. Because you notice he asks, who is my neighbor? He assumes he is loving God with everything that he has, and he's good in that category. But you also see he assumes he may not be that perfect in loving his neighbor. So he wants an out. He wants an excuse to justify himself, to say, I'm okay, I'm good enough for God. And so what Jesus does is he engages the lawyer's heart. And he doesn't do it directly. He does it with a story. Because stories have a great way of involving the listener. And the listener is able to identify themselves in a story and not even know they're doing it. Jesus calls the man out, engages the man's heart with the story. And the story is that of the Good Samaritan where a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he fell among robbers. He got beaten up, left for dead. And a priest comes on by, steps to the side, and avoids the man. A Levite comes along. Same thing. These are two characters who know the law, like the lawyer, and yet avoid the man who's in trouble, which, ironically, the law commands them to help the man in trouble. And already the lawyer is identifying himself. His heart recognizes, I'm that priest. I'm that Levite. And then the Samaritan comes along. This somebody who's a dregs of society. And he comes to the man. He helps the man. He takes the man to the inn. He pays for the man to get better. He pays for the man's lodging. And Jesus asked the lawyer this question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And right here, the lawyer, it's not Jesus saying, you're the priest. It's the lawyer's own heart that's engaged, that brings the lawyer to the point of saying, the one who showed mercy. And you see, I'm reading this into the text, but I believe the lawyer didn't say it boldly, but said it with some hesitancy, maybe some humility, because he recognizes, I'm not 
that Samaritan. Because in the story, Jesus flipped the lawyer's question. The question the lawyer asked is, who is my neighbor? Which is a very nice way of saying, who can I get away with not loving? And Jesus flipped it to, who is a neighbor to the man in trouble? Which is, can you get away with not loving somebody? And the heart's engaged. The lawyer's on the spot. And the lawyer is left answering the obvious and condemning himself by his own heart and by his own words. And then Jesus moves him to the next stage and he invites a response with a simple statement. When Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And this is where Luke ends. And we're left wondering, what does the lawyer say? What does the lawyer do? His assumptions have been dashed. His heart has been exposed. And Jesus just gave him a command to go do that which he cannot do. And so if the lawyer is honest with himself, he's left with the response of, I can't. You say go, and I can't. I am not a neighbor. I am incapable of this kind of love, which means I'm not good enough to do something to earn eternal life. Which may lead him to the point of saying, I am actually that man beaten up by robbers and left for dead. And I need a good Samaritan. I need Jesus to come and save me. But what the lawyer responds, we do not know. And sometimes as we engage someone in a conversation, we don't know what their response will be. But if we've asked questions and engaged the heart, they're left with the response it's between them and God. And in my life, recently, I've had a conversation, multiple conversations with a young man. I'll call him Jeremy. It's not his real name, but we'll just go with Jeremy. And Jeremy, I really like him. Uh, one, because when we get together, I drink coffee. And I can drink it a lot. And I like coffee. But unfortunately, Jeremy doesn't drink coffee. It's something we're working on in our friendship to try to help him enter into the joy of the Java and the joy of Jesus. But at least step by step, baby steps. And, you know, Jeremy, he has a good job. He works really hard, but he does not like his job. He feels like a dead-end job. He's really stressed out. And Jeremy, this is one of the reasons I like him. He's a perfectionist, and I am too, in some areas, little small areas of perfectionism in my life. But so for him, like anything, you know, my wife goes, yeah, a little bit of perfectionism. <laughs> um, like, so anything in his life which is not perfect, that is not excelling, is like he is personally failing. And it is eating away at him. And he was just talking. Eventually he opened up. He's like, I just don't feel like I am a success in my life. I see my coworkers, And they're bringing in a bank. And they like their job. And I look at myself. And I am just not successful. And as we are talking, you know, I'm condensing uh, at least a half hour conversation into just a few minutes. Eventually, we got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm curious. What do you mean by success? I went right to his assumption. And in doing so, this is just a little bit of a tip. When I was engaging him, I'm really after Jeremy's heart where I'm going after his assumptions, one, some tips in this are to consider, okay, I'm not here to criticize Jeremy and saying, you idiot. What's wrong with you chasing money? Don't you know money doesn't satisfy? Don't you know Ecclesiastes says God's placed eternity in man's heart? 
a God-shaped hole and nothing but God can satisfy. So money and success, they'll never fill. I mean, maybe if you're an extrovert and you're confrontational in evangelism, that's your approach. Go for it if it works for you, but that's not me. Um, rather, I just wanted to let him know I'm giving sincere appreciation for him to actually open up this area of his heart because he's a perfectionist. He doesn't want to show weakness ever. And so I want to be genuinely interested in him. I want to listen to him and not just be thinking of my next answer or my next question. I want to make Jeremy feel like he's important and sincerely important to me because otherwise that door's just going to shut. And so when I investigated his assumptions, asking him, dude, what do you mean by success? How do you even define that? He's, he's honest. I mean, he's a smart guy. He's like, well, it means I make a lot of money, at least enough to live comfortably. But, you know, I'm not selfish. He goes, because I want to help people. I want to be successful. I want to help people. You know, and I, I'm goal-driven. I have a lot of goals. I want to reach those goals. That's what success means to me. I say, all right, but I'm curious. I like saying that because it's true and it's a nice little segue. Um, I, it's really admirable. I love your goals. But how will you know when you've transitioned from being on the road to being successful to actually being successful? I'm an engineer. How do you measure it? And I appreciate Jeremy because he didn't respond immediately. He sat there and thought about it. And then the honesty continued to come out. He said, you know, I've never actually thought about it that way. You know, I've always lived my life for goals, one goal after another, because if I'm not always driving towards a higher goal, it means I'm lazy. If you're lazy, you're a drain in society, and you're worthless. And I don't want to be that. And then he took the next step. He said, you know, so I guess that means if I reach whatever goal I determine is successful, means to be successful, once I reach it, I can't be happy. Because that means I'm being lazy, because I don't have another goal. So I'll never actually be content I'll never truly be successful in my own eyes. And that was a lot. And it, I appreciated it. I let him know it. And then I responded, just let him know, you know, it really does sound like you're stuck. Like you're just in this never-ending cycle. Never going to reach this goal. Never going to be content in life. And you know what? That sounds miserable. Which he was like, yeah. And so this is where I moved to really starting to try to engage him in his heart, where I asked him, how could it be, could it be possible to be both successful and content in one's life? Is it even possible? Because his assumption is it's not possible. To which he said, I would love for that to be true but I have no idea how. So right there, things are set up to enter in. And if you notice, this is something I try to do with my questions, and this is a little tool just to throw it your way, is when I ask people questions like Jeremy, I ask a lot of questions, who, where, what, when, how, but I avoid why, like the plague. Because what I found is asking someone why takes them out of their heart and right back into their head. Because now they've gone into investigative mode, analytical mode, and they've disengaged the heart from the head, which is the opposite direction from where I hope to take somebody. And so when I engaged his heart, he was there dangling like, okay, because he knew built in coming next, because he also knows I'm a Christian. We've had that talk, and he also knows that I know he's not a Christian, and he knows that I know that he knows 
that he really doesn't like talking about Jesus or the Bible or spirituality at all. He's standoffish. His, he nicely told me at one point, look, I grew up with a buddy of mine. He's a pastor now. If I ever want to talk about Jesus, I'll go to him and I'll quiz him about theoretical spiritual stuff. And so I know, okay, if I'm going to engage the heart, I've got to do it like Jesus did in Luke 10. I've got to enter in the side door with a story. And so what I did is I just told him a story. Leading up off of his question, I said, you know, there was a man. He was born with like a silver spoon in his mouth. The best family in the best city with the best heritage. He grew up going to the best school, like the Ivy League schools, not Brown, maybe like Harvard or MIT. And under the best teachers, if you, my sister went to MIT and they really like to make fun of Brown and Harvard. And so it's just inside family jokes, so sorry about that. Especially if you went to Brown. Um, <laughs> it's a little snobbishness. But I was there and I was like telling him about this man. He had it all. He was up and coming. He was the, just what you would call successful in life. He had made it in life. He had made it when he was young in life. And all of a sudden, he threw it all away. All of a sudden, he dumped it all, changed life direction, set up new life goals, and started going around, and basically it was almost like a startup business. From ground up, and it seemed to be going well at first. Some people really didn't like it. But eventually, it was going well, going well, and then it's like his whole life started crumbling. People started attacking it, going at it all over the place. He eventually ended up in jail. His friends all left him, and he died alone, not knowing if everything he had built was just going to be taken over and destroyed. When you look, and I asked Jeremy, when you look at that man's life, was he successful? Jeremy was straightforward, no. <laughs> he could have been. He was. Then he did something stupid, and he lost it all. I said, all right, it makes sense, but I'm, how about this? The man I just told you about is a guy we call the Apostle Paul. And he is somebody who wrote half of the New Testament. And historians, secular and religious, say he is probably one of the most influential men in history who helped shape civilization for the past 2,000 years. Without him the world would be completely different. How about now? He was like, all right, <laughs> you got me. Okay, he was successful. And here's where I followed up. So what is the difference between Paul and his success and your definition of success? What's going on here? Because Paul said he was always fighting for more goals, and yet he was content in life. He wrote about it. And he even said all the other stuff that we call success, he called dog poop. So what's the difference in definitions? And this is where Jeremy goes, you know what? It seemed Paul was driven by something inside of him. Well, I'm driven by something outside of me. And I was like, hmm. And I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> because I know he's sensitive. And I've also learned that many times silence is golden. That if I jumped right in there, he would have bailed out immediately. So I let him wrestle in his own heart with what is that that Paul has that I don't have. And then he got uncomfortable with the silence because we as people, we're all plugged in and we're like always hitting buttons and having screens in front of our face and texting and Instagramming selfies to everybody because we cannot stand silence anymore. Society has driven us away from the ability to sit and think and be happy. And so it didn't take but 30 seconds for Jeremy to just be utterly uncomfortable with a lack of talking. And he goes, I guess what Paul had is Jesus. And I don't 
have Jesus. At what point, I smiled really big, and I went for the response, but I did it in a little bit different. Maybe I did it wrong. Who knows? But I smiled, and I laughed, and I said, you know, in kids' church, we quickly learned that if you're ever asked a question, and you don't know the answer, you say, Jesus, and you're right 90% of the time. (laughs) And so I was like, you know what? And I think you gave me the Sunday school answer that you hoped, I hoped that you would say, but I'm really not interested in the so-called right answer. I'm interested in what you are thinking. I'm interested in what's going on in here and not the Sunday school answer. And at that point, the wall that jumped up dropped. And Jeremy relaxed, thanked me for it, and said, you know, honestly, I can see how Jesus may very well be the answer, but this is new to me, and I would really like to think about this some more. I would really like to investigate this some more. And this is where I responded to his response with a statement of, all right, I'm interested in hearing more. This is a big deal. So how about we get together next week over coffee and talk about it some more? And he said, sounds good. And then Jeremy and I, we've had multiple conversations since, and we continue to have conversations about Jesus. And this is an approach that I've adopted because it's something that I'm comfortable doing. And it's something that also helps me disengage from the analytical mindset I have and the pressure to always be presenting a sermon on the spot to somebody whenever they have a question about the gospel, but instead to remind myself, what am I here for? I'm here for this person. I care for this person. I want to engage on a journey with a person by asking them questions to help them investigate their own assumptions, engage their heart, and go from response to response to response with my prayerful hope that one day that response will be, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. My hope is that this could be a tool that each of you might consider using at some point as you talk with a friend, a coworker, or a family member. That person you're thinking about, you just have some questions for them. Pressure's off of you. You're just seeking the person's welfare by engaging the heart with questions. So Jeff Fries is going to come up, and he's going to share a brief testimony of his experience along these lines. There's a, there's a couple different kinds of conversations that you're going to get into with people. Um, one, one is what I call more like short-term questions. This is where you're standing in line maybe with someone at the grocery store. Another is long-term, and that's like what Seth described, where week after week after week he's getting together with people. And I found that especially for the short-term conversations, you have to get really good at small talk. Um, You have to, like, for example, you're standing in line with someone at at the the grocery store or whatever. What is one one form of small talk you could engage in? You could say, crazy weather we're having. (laughs) Huh? All right. Can everyone try that with me here? Crazy weather we're having. Huh? Ready? Okay, go. Huh? I found this is one of the, the easiest ways to engage in conversation with people. Um, I've appreciated our getting into the gospel over the summer because it's kept me on my gospel toes, so to speak. And I've, sp- I've spent a lot of time at uh, Lifetime Fitness over the summer in the sauna doing my uh, executive workout. Uh, <laughs> now, if, if you're in a sauna, let me ask you, um, what is... 
one, one simple question you could use to engage in a conversation when you're in a sauna. Yeah. <laughs> and you could do that every time, and it's, it's the same. So, so I go in there, and I sit down, and wow, it's hot in here. And um, I remember one time I was sitting next to a, a young, like a, probably a teenager, and he, somehow he told me he was from Somalia. So I said, well, hey, are, are you Muslim? And he said, yes. Now let me ask you a question. What is something I could say to him after he says that he's a Muslim? Well, you know, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I'm a Christian. That's what I said. He said, you know, I'm a Christian. And um, I, said, uh, I said, hey, I, I'm a, I was always curious, what, what, what does a Muslim believe about Jesus? And um, I remember he said, my friend told me that Jesus didn't actually die or whatever. I said, I said no, 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 your friend was wrong. He, he, was, uh, he died, he was three days in, in, in the ground, and it wasn't an out-of-body experience. That's kind of like a short-term conversation. You have to get right to the point. Um, and I could tell you many more from, from being in the sauna. Um, <laughs> I was with somebody last week, and he said, that, uh, he said that he worked in Grandview. Now, if you're ever in a conversation with somebody, and they say they live in Grandview or they work in Grandview, what is the next thing you should say? <laughs> yeah. Man, my church is in Grandview. Grandview and I, I remember um, he like... Uh, he ran out the door before I could invite him, you know? I was just like, oh. But, that, but that's the, that's the short-term conversation. Now, in, in the long-term conversation, like Seth said, I mean, I, I really appreciate what he said. He, he's not trying to get the guy saved in one conversation. He realizes, man, this is going to be long-term. Um, I mean, I used to wonder, um, could someone do a study? How many cups of coffee does it take to get one man to love Jesus. How many gyros does it take? And um, the only bit of advice I could give on the long-term conversation where you're meeting with someone week after week and you realize, man, this is going to be 15 months, 24 months, this is going to be long-term, is that person cannot think that you are treating them like a project. Like, oh, you're, you're my project, and, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to get you saved, and, and um, I don't care about what's going on in your life. I don't care what struggles you have. I just want you to answer my questions. Um, sorry. And, um, and I remember just a real quick story. I was meeting some, I had one of these long-term conversations, like Seth had said, where I was meeting with him week after week after week. This person was a Christian. But I was kind of discipling, shepherding them. And um, I remember I sat down with them and I just said, hey, uh, do, you know, did you read your verses? Did you do um, your homework for the week? And he was, um, he uh, uh, just kind of seemed like any, he was in a bad mood. And I just kind of, I kept, because to me, he was a project. I need, you, I need you to answer my questions. I need you to do this thing. And um, then I remember he just got up and he left. And um, kind of like your, your aunt falling asleep on you. I mean, you, wh while you're learning this, you're going to have all kinds of these, con are, are these uh, things that happen. You just have to learn from them. And um, anyways, I had found out later on down the road that he had just found out that day that he got rejected for grad school. And there I was, a uh, young apostle, sitting down with him. And, um, you know, so sometimes I think, the first question we need to ask people is, hey, how's your day going? Um, what's happening with you? You know, r really show the person that you actually care about them as, as a person, as a human being. You're caring for their soul, not just, I need, you're my project, and I need to, I need to achieve my stated goal. Um, so with that, um, Thad is going to come up and Say something about Kyle, right? Because this is Kyle's last day here. And I remember I was just talking to Christina um, <laughs> earlier. Because when we, um, when we started Oasis, 
Um, whenever you start a church, you have to meet somebody like Christina because they go and they invite all their friends and then you've got like 30 or 40 people in your church and you say, oh, I, I, I'm such a good church planner. Uh, um, but I remember Christina invited her whole dorm and she invited somebody and I think then they invited you, right? They, they, cause they lived across the hall. Christina invited somebody and then Kyle and his roommate lived across the hall, and then they eventually got invited, and then Kyle came. Um, now, now, Megan, how did you find out about GC? Through Kyle? Know, Matt or him. Either or Kyle, you invited her to church? Sure. Good job, man. <laughs> Good job. Um, and I remember, I remember, this is another thing in the gospel. You, always, you can't always pay attention to the outside, because I remember when Kyle first came around, there was him, and this other guy, and I just thought, oh, so much hope for this young man, but Kyle, uh, I, I don't know about him. He doesn't, uh, but, um, you know, he eventually, uh, I, think, I think your secret's just like mine, Kyle. You just keep showing up. You just keep showing up and keep showing up. He, he learned to play the guitar while he was in the band because our, our Oasis band needed a guitar player, and... Um, that's another decision. I wasn't, I don't know if I was quite on board with that. But I mean, he, 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 learned, he learned the guitar. And um, so we're going to miss you, Kyle. Uh, well, basically for two reasons. One, because Kyle is going away. He's leaving us, sadly. And uh, the other reason is that I'm, I'm basically a, a disciple of Jeff, you could say. You know, sitting there listening to him talk. I have been able to follow Jeff around and watch him in action doing this, like asking people questions. And I would always think I could not do this myself, but I actually had the opportunity to do this with Kyle for some time. Uh, so like Jeff said, uh, Kyle, he, he, he started coming to our church eventually, but there was a time when uh, he, he just wasn't interested in church at all. I, I think what happened was uh, you got invited to a small group by uh, Jordan. Uh, the, he was a guy in your dorm room, right? And so Kyle found out that there was food at this Bible study. I don't think he was interested in the Bible study part so much. I think he was just there for the food, basically. And so this guy, is, he's in my small group for about a year, and he never showed up to church all year long. And we would have these uh, Bible studies. We'd, we'd plan, and we'd think, let's ask a question that, that someone like Kyle could answer. And he would never say a word. He would never talk during Bible study. And so I had pretty much ridden Kyle off as just like an unspiritual friend. <laughs> He's a guy that I'm going to have lunch with every week. You know, we, we would have lunches together in the union. Uh, we would play football Friday nights. Uh, we would even try to work out. I think we worked out maybe once or twice. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> it didn't really last. But about a year went by of this, just these little interactions with Kyle. And like I said, I had ridden him off. It's just being an unspiritual friend. And at some point, uh, the, one of the other guys that Jeff mentioned, uh, we were doing a mentorship program with this guy. Uh, one of the other student leaders at Oasis and I, we saw this guy and we thought, he's so promising, let's, let's do this discipleship program with him. And we're doing this, and at some point, uh, Kyle and I are, were talking, and Kyle finds out that this has been going on, and Kyle asked me a question. He says, hey, how come you never asked if I wanted to do this? And I just thought, man, ooh, I feel bad. I feel terrible. Because <laughs> I was like, this guy, he's not going to church. He doesn't talk during Bible study. There's no hope for him. And so I just I felt so terrible for writing him off. And I think that just goes to show that you can't judge people on the surface. Like, judge, like Jeff said, like you can't just assume that God isn't doing something in a person's heart. And I think when you see that uh, this person likes to be around with you, uh, he, he likes to be around you, and he's, he's maybe not saying much about Jesus, but he's there listening to the word. I think we have to be able to go past the small talk, uh, the, the fun and the friendship, and we have to be able to take that next step and ask them, what, what, is, uh, what does, does God mean to you? What, what is God doing in your life? Is, is any of this resonating with you? And so I'm, I'm very encouraged to see all of what uh, God has done in Kyle's life. I've seen uh, you do. I've seen you, you do a lot for the Lord. I'm very encouraged by the way that you've ministered toward others. I've even been able to see other people in the church grow up and really mature. And I've been ministered 
to through them. And I look back and I say, Kyle was working with that person at some point. And so I, I want to leave you with a couple of verses. Because you asked me that question, right? Why didn't you uh, ask me if I wanted to be discipled? Well, in John chapter 15, Jesus is talking. And he says uh, in verses 7 and 8, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And so Kyle, now as you are moving on, you finish school, you're getting married, you're going to start a job, you're in the real world now. My hope for you is that you would continue to have that desire to be discipled. And don't just stop at, uh, at going through a uh, program or an event, but I, I hope that you would have these big wishes that you would ask the Lord, do this in my life. Uh, do something big through my marriage, through my, my uh, church community. Um, I hope that you would be a great presence for the Lord in your office and that you would bring much glory to him. Uh, Easter Sunday, 2007, that I picked up a guitar for the first time and led worship to four people, <laughs> uh, which was good because it was a pretty terrible Sunday. So the fewer people who had to hear it, the better off we were. But for the last eight years, I've been blessed to be part of this church. I was with Oasis. I was here when we launched in, in Upper Arlington. I've seen us grow. I've moved down here to Grandview and become a wonderful community here in this city. And I know that God has a lot more in store for you. I know that you're going to be moving to the school in, in the near future. And I know that the Lord is going to bless you there. And he's going to bring a lot more people who are just like me. And so John asked me today to, to say goodbye, but I'm not going to do that because I think that goodbye means that the relationships we built over the last eight years and the love we have for each other cease to exist when I walk out that door. And I know that's not true. So instead, I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say thank you for not writing me off that when it would have been so easy. And I'm going to say thank you for discipling me and, and laboring with me and striving to see me grow. And I'm going to say thank you for the love and the care and the comfort that you've poured out, for the encouragement you've given me, for everything that I've received from you and everything that I was honored to be able to give back. I thank you for coming in here Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, some of you year after year, and giving me the joy to lead you in worship and see the love and the grace of God reflected in you. And I want to leave you with this, and that's, Never underestimate the power of a church to change someone's life. Never underestimate the gift that God has given you to affect someone else. Because so often over the last eight years, it would have been easy for me to just walk away. I could have just given up, walked out the door, and not come back. But often in those, in those darkest times, in those hardest moments, what kept me coming back were the people sitting in here today. Because in you I saw God's love, and I saw his grace, and I saw his wonder, and his mercy, and his majesty. In you I see reflected everything that our Lord wants, wants us to have. And that's what's come, kept me coming back week after week, year after year, is, is you, all of you. And so thank you. As I leave today, thank you for everything. Thank you for being my friends, my family, for being the people I call my brothers and my sisters. I think the band is going to come up now. And just one last time, let's let's sing as loud as we can and worship together.